Hey, Todd Smith here, uh, CEO of 360 Converge, joined uh, by Dominic. And let me give a brief little background. I'll let Dominic introduce himself a little bit more thoroughly. But uh, Dominic had posted that he was really taking on all, almost all the internet leads uh, from his store a few weeks ago as COVID hit and you know, staff had been cut. And uh, he put up some pretty impressive numbers. I think the results were about 80 or so sales by himself. And it got me really thinking of the new normal. Will we come back with the same amount of staff? Will uh, we be able to sell more cars per person through uh, new efficiencies and stuff? So I wanted to get Dominic uh, on a call today and uh, spend some time with us and learn a little bit about what he's doing. And with that, uh, Dominic, give us a full introduction of you. Yeah, so um, I'm the BDC director, centralized BDC director for five of the stores in the Bach Auto Group. Uh, it's the DCD Automotive Holdings Group. Um, and just, you know, I've been with these stores, these specific stores I've had for about seven months now. And, uh, you know, it's usually a team of 18 people. And when everything shut down, uh, not only did uh, we furlough my entire staff, but they actually furloughed the BDC staffs of all the other stores, the other four stores in the group. Wow. And so I was the only BDC person for nine stores, which are typically responsible for 2,000 to 2,500 car sales a month. Wow. And so lead count wise, we're talking five to 6,000 leads a month normally. And we were down to a lot less than that, um, right. but even 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 with how much it dropped for one person, it was a lot. Yeah, I can imagine that's uh, sorry, my little light time just goes on and off. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. So you obviously saw traffic drop. I think everybody agrees yeah. that was kind of universal. But you know, here throw us into what you did. I mean, you went from a, a pretty large staff for a BDC, a centralized BDC, plus some additional staff inside stores to help even uh, more, right? For probably product presentation, delivery, things like that. So walk me through that. Like, what was the go-to? Did you change messaging in the CRM? Did you turn off all the auto responses? Like, how did you kind of go, oh my gosh, we're still got to respond to now tons of leads. What were, what was the dynamic changes there? So, so there we we sort of we we tackled it pretty quick with understanding that there was going to have to be some pretty significant differences in being able to handle that quantity because we we were very unsure about how serious the customer base was going to be at that time and exactly how much work it was going to take in order to to produce something okay so uh we at first we shut down most of the automated emails and most of the uh, the, the process, the, the user generated processes, because we recognized that our first goal was just going to be to respond to fresh leads, make sure there was a response okay. and to go from there. So we use drive centric CRM yep. and it has, uh, we, we subscribe to the genius AI. And so we left that in place. And a lot of the first responses, at least the, you know, it does emailing and texting pretty well. So that it handled that side of things. But even with that, you know, depending on how much time I had, how many leads were sitting there, I'd still try to tackle, you know, sending, I, I first and foremost, I would always make a call. Uh, I would try to, I'd usually skip texting because it's an opt-in CRM. So you don't want to double opt-in too fast, sure. but we would, uh, I'd still, I'd send a personalized video email. Right. And then I'd type up an email, you know, if there was a quote involved or anything to that effect. Uh, make sure. Otherwise, it was just my two go-tos were the call and the video. The, the typed up email was, was just if I was sending them information about a used car or uh, if I was sending them pricing information. Other than that, you just skip and get to the next thing. Uh, you mentioned something interesting. So video. What are you doing with video? So normally, I, I've done personalized video a lot because drive-centric is very, very conducive to that. But right. um, I... I changed the message a lot because instead of just an introduction, talking about some why buys and explaining pricing, it sort of shifted. I still did some of that, but a lot of it was about, I wanted to sort of explain the way the process works to customers first. Okay. 
uh, and tell them essentially. So, so my process with the video is basically telling them, introducing myself, telling them how the process works, then giving them, you know, any pricing and information questions answered that they would normally ask. Cause I, I found very quickly that describing the process and how things work right now to them sort of changed the direction of the conversation so that they understood the way where things were going and they had the right mindset when we started talking. Okay. Um, because I saw at first, especially a lot of customers that just expected us to have enormous discounts and just <laughs> trying to give our cars away because you can't, you can't sell a car right now. And right. it's sort of, if you tell them, you know, we're, we're mostly closed, the government shut us down, but we still have the ability to sell to a central business and uh, get, help people buy cars. It's just, we're working by appointment only right now and we're giving people everything up front so you don't have to waste your time coming to the dealership and risk things if we can get you everything in advance. So that way you're just coming when you're ready. Uh, and sort of setting them up that way, instead of having that conversation where they expect you to just give everything away off, right off the bat, they just sort of, I really, I felt like they just, they came from an understanding viewpoint more and they sort of, at least in a lot more cases than they would just, you know, the conversation goes in the direction of what do I need to give you so that you're ready instead of how much am I knocking off this car in order to convince you to consider me like, right. So yeah. to me, you, you, I, I hear you, what you're saying and I saw be super clear. And so it was more of, I used the video to set up the process of right. the experience. So you're setting the customer expectation, the value prop, everything a little right up front versus jumping into, let me get you that price quote on that car, which a lot of times I, I feel like most, a lot of I've seen internet responses, they go right to it. Like customer says, I, I want a price on a, I don't know, Mazda 6, right? And instantly it comes back, well, here's the price quote on a Mazda 6. And it, it, at that point, it looks very transactional. And right. I think you lose control of the customer and the experience, obviously. Um, I think that's why probably so many managers are like, just get them in. Just get them in the door. You know, right. don't give them much. Just get them in. Um, so you used video to kind of set up the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you felt like it was, in most cases, a more palatable uh, communication with the customers that were seriously interested. So what, what percentage of the customers do you think were just those, oh, car dealers must be desperate, so I'm opportunistically going to try to get a car versus, you know, how many were really kind of in the market? Did, was there a, was it a lot of customers that hit you guys up that were really like, oh, they're going to go out of business, so we'll, we'll get a car? I think that that's the loud minority. They, uh, I think it was a small percentage of people that were expecting us just to give things away, but okay. they were very, very persistent and and still are. And they just, it, it's, it, it was, it was surprising to me how many people that we did get that were that way, but right. I would still say the percentage was low. They just were very, very loud. Okay. That's interesting to know, uh, you know, well, look, everyone wants a deal on a car, because I feel a lot of people, even when they, they actually get a deal, they don't believe they got a deal because there are some cousins, brothers, nephews, you know, second uh, cousin who got a better deal somewhere else, right? right. That, that seems to be about that. So, okay, so you went down to you, really. You are doing all the responses. You're, you're, you're sending a video. I assume that's a personalized video that you would yeah. send? Okay, so... Yep. So you had to generate that video. Uh, did you include the car into it or was this just a you kind of selling you in the process first? So I, the beginning of the video is setting up the process, but I would still, I'm, I'm still going to give them if they requested information or pricing, I still going to answer those questions. I just want to make sure that understanding the process is out of the way first. Got it. So that they're in the right frame of mind when we start talking about everything else. So okay. they're still going to get the price quote. They're still going to get the details pretty quick. It's just they, I wanted to set the tone before I started off anything else. Okay. So you set the tone with the, the video, send that off to them. Then, uh, I mean, what was, the, what was the outcome of this? I mean, I, I assume video gets a pretty good response rate overall uh, compared to sending an email or uh, even calling and leaving a voicemail. I, I felt like 
you know, video shows you, character shows, uh, and if you're answering the question in the email or in the video, that's got to be powerful too. So right. what was like, how many leads did you go through, let's say, what, March or April? April is probably a good solid month, right? Right. So in the time that I was mostly long, so we, we pretty quickly, because we realized the lead count didn't drop as fast as we thought, we started calling people back for, you know, short shifts and things. So we had okay. an average day, probably three people on staff after the first week. Okay. Were, responding to leads other than other than the GMs themselves in the stores were all also responding to leads uh, when they could um, but the so in that time I worked 600 leads personally um, and that was I mean it's just a, it's so many leads especially because like the, the contact rate was high the right. number of people we talked to outside of the the third party leads that just weren't generating that much that, you know, shopping, you're pretty much talking to just about everybody. Right. And the response rate was very, very high. And just trying to shift through, just getting through the responses winds up when you have 600 leads that you're reaching out to, you know, that gets turns into a time consuming thing and, and you can't be that fast with it because you're, you know, having, you, you know, when you take, up to 80 leads in a single day and you're getting responses from over half of them. And so you have to deal with the replies from that. And it's not just one, it's not just one time in a day, you know, you're still replying from the people from before and here and there. Okay. So a lot of the time, you know, you priorities start shifting as the day goes on. Normally you're geared to just get the, the, the fresh leads done fast. Your response rate on those fresh leads has to be your top priority, get to those people and, and get through it. But when you have the number of replies that you have there and you just never are finishing the fresh leads through the day, you realize you're walking over a dollar to pick up dimes when you're hitting all the fresh leads first. Yeah. And so for me, I, I had to switch gears to hitting the replies first and then get back to the fresh leads because they're going to be sitting there for hours no matter what I do and essentially just hit, the, hit all the replies as much as I can because you know, then you're actually generating the, the complete send to the appointment or the sale from right. that point instead of just always dealing with fresh stuff and never finishing anything. So what, walk me through the process then. Uh, initial uh, video goes, I, I assume that's you send it via email yep. and, and they respond. I would assume the channel's mostly still email, but maybe some customers call at that point yeah. or you know, follow in. So what happens next? I mean, did you try to move them to text or something you could have better control of, or did you try to really just live and die between the email and phone? So I would, you know, it would just, it just depends. I, I usually like to stick to whatever channel the customer seems to prefer and just do it that way. But if they opt into texting, I'm going to do texting. You know, if okay. they, if they are responsive to calls, I still want to do calls, but uh, a lot of times I would prefer the texting and the email because it's faster for me to just send something off than to have an entire conversation while there's chat chats that are starting up and work. Cause I, I mean, at that time, you know, usually I'd have at least two chats going and you know, up to I've had up to 12 at one time where you're trying to respond to customers and it's just overwhelming, but yeah. uh, answering the inbound fun. calls that are all asking why the service department isn't answering phone and just, you know, between all that stuff, it's very, very difficult to be on the phone that much if you're trying to be effective with everything. Yeah. So I would lean towards the texting and the emails more than the phone calls even at that point. Yeah, I feel like you just you just went through a really good like triaging time, right? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. How do I triage this massive amount of like customer influx? Um, because, you know, everyone's like, oh, business is going to dry up. But I, I, I've talked to a lot of people. It really didn't. Um, you know, there was still always a need there, uh, for cars. Now, of course it, it diminished in some markets more yeah. than others. Um, but that being said, um, you know, my interest with you really today is that triaging, like, how do you get through, you know, leads? Because one thing I don't think you have like the pure answer to, but it's definitely a good lesson is right. you took on a lot more leads, uh, than, I mean, look, average dealer, you're going to give each sales, how many reps or how many uh, leads do you give per rep normally? 
to work? So the goal is 230. That's that's about our target. Okay, so 230. And I, I mean, that's a lot. I've seen guys more than into the hundreds, right? 100, right. you know, 80 to 110, 120. So you're on a high end of that in in the B, in your BDC. So mm -hmm. interesting enough, like efficiency. How did you? You know, I'm curious with like how what were your efficiency models to get through this mass volume, and will you apply these things moving forward that your reps take even more leads, right, uh, than what they were taking before? Because I think the the underpinning thing I hear right now is pe we're bringing people back, but not everybody back. And we're going to try to do more with less. And I, that seems to be the more reoccurring theme I'm hearing now. And I, I'm curious to you what your thoughts are there. And are you changing your processes to absorb more? So we haven't made any final determinations with things like that, but definitely you know, I, I think that it becomes obvious that you you can do more, but I think that we have to be careful with that thought process in a little way because it it's sort of all of us at that time we're looking at it as a temporary thing, and so we understand we're all going into overdrive and we're putting in significantly more efforts, and it, it was I mean it's exhausting to go through that, <laughs> one. and to for me, I don't want to have the expectation for my reps to suddenly take, you know, the upper, take 300, 400 leads in a month and to have some expectation that they're going to produce correctly with that now, because the level of effort that it takes in order to do that is going to be so high that I think it's just going to burn them out. Sure. So I, I think that we see that it is possible to handle it with that. But I think we also have to recognize that everyone went into it with that mindset that this is temporary. We need your help. You guys are team players. Let's let's do what we can with what we have so that the dealerships survive. Yeah. And I think that we may have been more prepared than the average because we were already using some AI to help us. And I, I really do think that the genius AI helped me move through that stuff a lot better because I'd already have a lot of replies waiting when we came in in the morning for the fresh leads that came through. So there's a lot of people opted in texting. There's a lot of people that have, you know, asked for their questions and their emails, you know, so on with things like that. So it certainly helped sift through and start the engagement process. And I think that leaning on that a little bit is something that, you know, maybe we can do a little bit less applying in the beginning and, and let it do its work, but real, you know, in cases where it already has something generated, but overall, I don't think anything beats the quality of a, of, of a fully engaged and fully full effort put in response. Right. And I, you know, engagement, the response time is still effective if, if everyone is in the same boat, because I think the reason why we could get away with taking so much time to reply to customers is because a lot of dealerships in Massachusetts especially just are entirely closed and the ones that aren't are sort of in the same boat. So they are also taking that time. So I think it'll almost be like that uh, arms race again, that goes back to how fast can you start replying? And as people grow and the faster people reply are again, going to have that advantage. So you almost right. get forced into having less leads per person in order to be able to do that again. Yeah. Well, speed's always important. I mean, we've, we realize that, right. I, I think, a lot of times though we equate speed and quality and there's always a, a trade off there. Right. So, you know, right. because you got back to them fast, but if you didn't answer their questions, it's kind of a deflated experience. So you have, you have it, always something to uh, keep in mind uh, as right. you're going through that process. Now have, did you, you have a digital retailing uh, at set up or no, or so when, when things started, we, we didn't, but it was within a matter of a week that we got something set up. We have a, uh, a, a, a programming company that our parent company has a good relationship with called Yoga Cars, and they essentially built one for us pretty much on the fly. And uh, so that got put in place pretty quick. And, you know, it's been... I think that it helped a lot because a lot of people engaged with it off, off the bat to start things off. And so we started that whole process of bringing cars to people and just being able to shop from home. And so people started 
I think it's still the same thing as before because I saw a lot when we did have digital retailing opportunities, whether it's shot, click, drive, or otherwise, where nobody really finishes the process that way. They never pay through it or anything along those lines, but they get enough done that they decided they want it. They know this is what they want to do, and it, it helps you. You're starting a conversation in the middle instead of the beginning with the customer so that they're further along the process, and it helps you cut out sort of that initial part and get them to a more complete position where you're ready to actually do something right it, it, i think it's tough when a bdc reps or internet reps spend time when customers haven't even like selected the vehicle yet you know they're right. like, i'm still thinking about this or i don't know the difference between a tahoe and a suburban yet or i right. might go down even lower to traverse or something like i feel like when they're in that phase, it's not really good use of a, a person's time. And that's where right. digital retailing can help a lot because it allows you to compare cars side by side. It allows mm -hmm. you to kind of go through your own self exploration, I think, and uh, identify what is going to happen. But, you know, like anything, then there's going to be additional questions. And that's when I think a BDC uh, can play a, a bigger role. I kind of look at it as, you know, we don't really do anything for like a, a market qualified lead, right? We just take all leads in, attack them all the same and hope for the best versus putting them through like some gates, right? To say, ah, oh, let's get them to here, get them to there. So, um, so your process over this bit of time has really been, we're gonna respond, use AI, personal video, then we're gonna come in and then do all the cleanup follow up, which we would normally do response back and forth. Uh, did you notice or were there any changes in length of time it was taking? Did you see from, okay, you know, I, they've responded to the video and now we've gone through the process to, you know, close a, a lead. So on average, I would say transactions happened a lot faster. There were people that had to take some follow-up and some doing, but uh, part of it was, I, I think it has, I could be wrong, but I think more of it has to do with the fact that we were not continuing to reach out to customers after the fact uh, because there was just no, because we only had time to respond to the, to the actual replies and the fresh leads, we spent almost no time actually following up with any customers that had come in days prior, you know, just trying to reach out to them again. So. Right. I, I think, I really so think you, it didn't more to do that. you didn't do the, Hey, I'm going to send you nine emails and four right. phone calls. So you just abandon and said, if you want it, we're here. So, right. And, and so genius again, still sort of reaches out after some time, but genius waits a while after you stop reaching out once they've replied. And once you're engaged with them, it takes a long time for it to start engaging again. So, you know, we'd see some stuff maybe a week, two weeks after where maybe they'd come back, they'd reply to the, automated system but uh yeah i mean it was just basically it's like catch and release it's like you right. you're fishing for something they don't bite all right next fish i'm not gonna try right. for you anymore like well that it's kind of like you did a quasi like triage market qualified lead they're either they're qualified because of their engagement or they're not and i'm not going to force it because you had enough leads coming in with the limited staff that you just had to process, right? Get right. through it and, and make it happen. So, okay. So you said you took like 600 leads. So what was the breakdown of that? So 600 leads came in, what came out the back? Right. So a hundred of those were phone ups and the other 600 were internet leads. There was actually, there was more than 600 total. If you counted, uh, we get, uh, we also are an auto trader buying center. We okay. canceled the service, but they continue to send it. I'm, I'm certain because they just, they don't have anywhere else to send it. And they need somebody to be their customer service. Right. But so the, I probably took a hundred to 200 of those too, but we just had a, a templated message. We'd send them about, we're not buying cars right now. Like, or just essentially KBB isn't back, backing this. So please reach out once the shutdown's over. It's essentially okay. the message for those. But of the, of the stuff that we, the actual car specific leads that we were working on and uh, generating stuff from, from that 600 looking back at, it, I think it was a hundred and 70 set appointments with 
150 shown and 80 sales. Okay. And it was, honestly, I was very surprised on average when you looked at, so the, the total group, I think the actual shown to close ratio was somewhere close to a third, which I was, I was, I'm very, very surprised that I thought essentially, especially in the beginning, I thought that there's no way people are going to come out unless they're ready to buy a car. This shut down. Everything right. is, but. there's no reason why these people are going to risk it. But I've also seen statistics since that Massachusetts is doing the worst job at following the guidelines of the shutdown order. <laughs> and so I, that, it's not surprising to me after the fact, but the number of people that would come and just want to drive cars or just sort of check stuff out really, really surprised me. That's interesting. So the, the 80 out of 150 was actually, that was a lot higher than what the average was for people coming in and buying. So I, I don't know what caused it, but it's, it was very odd. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Like what? I don't know. I don't know why people think it's worth the risk, but they they're doing it. They want to just check out cars. We'd have a lot of people that would even. I had one customer specifically that made it uh, because I had access to all the stores. I knew she was making appointments at many stores. She called our Nissan store and she wanted to drive four different Nissan SUVs to compare them. And then once she drove all the cars from all the different manufacturers, she was going to decide what she wanted and buy that. Wow. So you, you were just like a test drive center. Right. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, we, we, you have to clean them all. Sanitize, and like sanitize back, the cars, sanitize, right? But it's weird that you're expecting all these dealerships to sanitize this many vehicles for, for you to, to just test them out. And you know, this is a customer. She, I don't even want to go in the building. I don't want to risk it. I just want to drive the car. <laughs> so she like recognizes the fact that there's some danger involved, but, but not so. enough. To stop her for her quest for something <laughs> right. her car. Wow. Amazing. There's always going to be an anomaly in the world, right? Of like yeah. doing some silly stuff. So, okay. So you went through, you got, uh, Lisa, you said you closed like 80 of them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I assume you probably had some trickle additional sales out of the ones that were just in the mix. Yeah. You came in and, you know, uh, you know, ultimately we'll still close out at some point. Um, what other, uh, I mean, what other good lessons, like, have you walked away with so far? I mean, like, what sticks out in your mind is like, oh, man, didn't know that. Now I know that. I can apply it uh, moving forward. So, uh, if, for me, I'll, I'll, it was... It was interesting just seeing the way people reacted because the one, the one big thing that did come out of it that I, I did expect, but it, it was... Well, I guess not fully, but that I really appreciated about the customer base is that when it comes to the show rate, not only did we have an 85% show rate throughout, but the people that didn't show up or that weren't going to be able to make their appointments, they were very, very responsive and they would almost always tell us in advance that they wouldn't be able to come. I think part of that was by setting the expectations and it was something that I sort of learned it by accident because I had a store that legitimately there was no one in the store and they were working from home. The GM was working from home to make appointments and they would only go in for the appointment. So I would have to tell the customers, I, I need to coordinate with the person that actually goes to the store that opens up, it's going to open up the dealership, sanitize the workstation, sanitize the car. So I just need to make sure that, you know, I coordinate with them to set this up. So does this time, this time, or this time work better for you? And they'd pick a time and I'd go, I'd have to call the, the manager and explain to them, this is what they picked. This is what they're going to do. And so they would head in and clean it up and get it ready. And so the customers at that point, those people all showed up. And so I started realizing sort of just like, a, all right, we're, I explained to them how this works and like people are going to have to, you know, explain what we have to do to prepare for them and make sure that they understand, you know, we're, we're mostly not at the store. We have to arrange for people to meet you there and coordinate everything. So they sort of, by setting that up and, and sort of doing things that way, people have been very, very responsive to it. So I think that there's something there even normally and just in helping the customer understand the importance of the appointment and what the value of it is and what's going into it for them. 
And I think that the more we are willing to commit to the appointment and the more that we tell the customer about it, the more they're going to be apt to show up for it. And I know that all the dealerships, obviously, that prepare cars and, and tell people about it, there, there's plenty of dealerships that have the high show rate. I just think that, you know, it's learning that it has so much to do with explaining the process to them. That was a big takeaway for me. It's just helping them to understand it. Yeah, you know, it's a really good point. And it's something maybe we take it take for granted a lot of times is the thought of we know how the whole process works, but do we explain it very often? Right. And we're we're always just trying to accomplish our milestones of, hey, I made contact with the customer, I've set an appointment, you know, they show up, you know, I test drive a car, I sell a car, uh, and deliver it. And, you know, but explaining that process i mean from what i hear you saying today there's huge value in it and well, it may be something that we're just not doing very well and maybe we should you know you obviously are setting them up in the intro video then you're coming back and again and explaining like hey here is our process uh that we're, that you're going to go through and i have to you know set somebody to the store i have to sanitize the workstation so you're building value in and, and like effort showing effort it's not just oh the car is there backed in sanitized and ready for you like right. there's gonna have to be someone that goes there so that obligates the customer a little bit more uh, because they see that oh to get what i want that person's going to have to do something so right that's interesting well, you, you think you'll put more of that in your processes moving forward then yeah, I, I think I'm going to have to look at just what the best way to describe our processes will be going forward and just making sure that that gets in there. I, I think the other key, too, was wrapping it up with after explaining it, because, you know, obviously a lot of people are afraid of objections. They don't like to ask a whole lot of questions that they don't want to have to answer. But, the, right. you know, the asking them after that, giving them an opportunity and saying, is there anything else I can answer for you or do you have any other questions before we lock this in? So giving them that opportunity then to sort of come up with any, you know, sort of giving them an out at that point, right. if they've just been stringing you along and then an opportunity to convince, reconvince them, because really if they are stringing you along, you, I, I'd especially prefer an opportunity to know that and have a direct conversation about it with a customer and then to soothe whatever concerns they have instead of just them then ghosting. Yeah. Yeah. Just, ghosting do. yeah. just not showing up. So right. That makes a lot of sense. So you think you will, you'll go back, change some of your process flow in the CRM or just to accommodate some of these things or. I don't know that process flow is going to be adjusted by it, but certainly the process with the communications and making so sure that we, right. yeah, from, from our standpoint, because I, I think that it's a thing that gets missed a lot of times anyway, especially with BDC reps and especially the new ones. They're always so determined just to get the appointment and to move on to the next one that they oftentimes don't do a whole lot after the fact. I think that half of the appointment comes after you've already set it and with what you do to firm it up after the fact and just the conversation there. And I think that that conversation needs to become even more in depth. Right. So I think that's where the biggest change is going to come. Okay. So, so, so that you're saying is, Hey, I set the appointment, but now you'll come back with a, here's the experience you're about to go through and, you know, safeguards we take. Do you have any other questions? So your final yep. smoke them out to make sure that, you know, nothing's going to go sideways. Right. So that's probably that area you're going to try to tune up the most in what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So it's really fascinating. I, I find like right now it's, this is great new learning time, you know, of seeing yeah. how to improve because you have to, and you're, you're having to make adjustments to process where you hadn't had to in a pretty long time. So it's kind of interesting. So um, what else is, is there anything missing now? Do you think technologically or something that you're going to have to see you figuring it out that, you know, you didn't have to figure out three months ago. So we actually have a new, so Massachusetts changed its rules again a few days ago, and now we're not allowed to test drive cars at all. 
So we can still sell them. We just can't let them test drive. So now, and they, they strict, they, they made the rules stricter about how we can handle the uh, internet appointments that they were allowing us to handle before. And so there's much, much stricter limitations to the people that we can have in buildings. So okay. now we're having to figure out how to do everything actually virtually at this point, because there's not really an option otherwise. So we're, we're sort of tackling it and we're, we're trying to use Google Meet to, to vir do virtual test drives, virtual walk arounds, and just do an entire event with the customer, present numbers, do everything that way. And I think that, you know, technologically speaking, there's a lot of limitations to what you can really do with that and helping people to actually experience the vehicle that way. It's very difficult. And we know that this is going to cause another contraction for us just in terms of what we're going to be able to do with it. But it's going to be, so it's going to be difficult, but we just have to, you know, that, that's going to be the, the hard part is figuring out exactly how to make that side of things work, how to really get them a feel for the vehicle without ever actually driving the vehicle before. That's tough, man. That's, that's a big challenge. I don't know how to solve that one. So that's definitely going to be, uh, wow, that'll be interesting. So, I mean, we, we started implementing, a, we have a, a buyback program. We've always done seven days for used cars, but now we're adding three days for new cars. Okay. And just sort of trying to avoid, you know, problems there. But, you know, that's, that has its own issues that you deal with there. But uh, oh, yeah. we're, we're hopeful that that will sate some concerns from people. But at the same time, people still, you know, you, it's still a financial commitment. And even with those types of buybacks, you know, you're not getting all the money back. Taxes are gone. You know, things like that is just sort of, you know, it's, it's imperfect. And so there's still plenty of concerns for people. We just have to figure that out yeah figure it out the new processes man lots of oh. lots of changes i think it's really tough when it's dynamically changing based on what you know massachusetts says at this point right. so that's got to make it a little bit more challenging just like no you can only drive backwards for the next four days <laughs> yeah. yes so that, that's going to be interesting so uh, have you brought more staff back yet or no or where no. are you at there for us, the Paycheck Protection Program came through. So we have the majority of the staff is back and active, but uh, there's a lot of people working from home and uh, the staff in the dealerships are still limited. And especially with the limitations of the quantity of people, uh, now it's mostly, you know, it, it makes it so that we almost have to do more with the customer or at least at a, a different location than here. So okay. uh, just... Paycheck protection has been a big help that way. It gives us the resources. Now we just have to use them effectively. So that brings up a point. How, you're, how are you communicating with your people working at home? Like normally I assume you have all your 16 people like in a room and right. you, know, you have, that's control. And now people are at home. Are you just monitoring through the CRM or how do you communicate with them all day long? I mean, it's, it's hard when you can't reach over and go, yo, you know, Dominic, dude, what the, you just blew that call. I mean, right. how's that work? It it's, it's hard. And, and I know the, the people that are working from home, their effectiveness is less than the people that are in the store. And we know that it's not, you know, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be, uh, we, we just have to account for it. And I, communication wise, I mean, we have, they can access most everything from home. Our company email is through gmail so they can log into that and i do a lot through email that way i you know we have texting i just text some personal phones and things and try to keep in touch that way i can't i can't really observe them over the phone you know uh and all the problem everything that i observe is after the fact so you know there's yeah it's like after the bomb went off like what it's clean, it's, it's, clean up, but yeah, yeah there's no it's not helpful usually after the fact, you know, so do you have a uh, like phone recall call recordings or, Oh, but if they're at home, you're not doing any of that probably. Right. Right. So that's, that's the issue. So we do, because it's click to call through the CRM, we can record their outbound calls. Okay. Um, inbound. They're not, they're not getting anything inbound right now. So there's, there's nothing there. So we do, 
call recording wise, we are pretty safe. Uh, we use interactive towel. So yeah. we Get do have, down. yeah, yeah. So we have, uh, it, it, that's been good for us. Uh, but in Massachusetts, you can only record the, it's, so it's two party. So you, uh, we can only record our side of the call. So we don't hear what the customer's saying. So it's still not perfect. Not that you would in a room anyway, but you can kind of get the feel of, Hey, let me take care of this. But, um, right. so we, we do still have some recording that we can handle it that way. But you know, that even right now, taking the time to really dig through that kind of stuff is not. Yeah. Hyper... I guess it gets the minutia stuff, right? Like you just right. like, you're like, man, I don't have time for that. This is block tackle work, I assume at this point. So, you know, what is that, that true block and tackle work? So do you see, uh, I mean, is lead quantity rising back up for you guys right now or are you seeing a little more uptick or? It's been steadily increasing since the initial drop and it's, it's high now. You know, I haven't looked at it in the past few days, but we're, I mean, it's still significantly down. I'd say that we were probably at, depending on which store we were looking at, the ne- ne- our Nissan stores have probably been hit the worst, and they're probably at maybe 30% of what they used to. Wow. And our higher stores, like our Chevrolet store, is probably at 80% of what it used to be. Yeah. And, you know, it sort of it varies in between there. But, you know, it just it's, it's all over the place. Yeah, I feel Chevy's that GM's high because man, they're throwing out awesome offers, man. Zero yeah. percent, eighty-four months, no payments for yeah. like three or four months. I mean, if you're gonna buy one of those cars, now's the time to do it. Oh yeah. Um, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, what about? I, I mean, uh, do, have you found like more like lead quality has improved in the sense the leads you're getting that they're more filled out? Uh, because one of the interesting things I've noticed in lots of CRMs that I've looked in that, you know, 40% of the lead data just was missing or inaccurate. Like people will put in only a first name, email address, you know, fake name, email right. address. I mean, have you seen any higher level of like quality lead data or no, just kind of the same stuff rolling through? So at first I would say that definitely went up. Uh, I think that as the lead quality has come back, or sorry, the lead quantity has come back, we've sort of gone to, it's sort of returned to the way it used to be. So I think that, you know, it's not as, I, I, I think that it, it's sort of, we've the quality is all, it's still better, but it's returning to the way it was. Because especially when it comes to our website leads, I would say our normal website leads, the quality is up. Uh, the digital retailing leads, I think that because of the way those are described, it, uh, it naturally draws people to put in more fake information. So those, I think, have it more often than a lot of our other leads because they, right. they see it as a shopping tool and they're, they're trying to go through it. But when you ask for information first, then they just, I just want the information. Give me, put in John Smith. Yeah, eight six seven five three zero nine, and here's a random email address. Got it. And so, when they start interacting with that, you know, maybe they contact us after the fact, but uh, just to get to the information, they're definitely putting in more fake info. Interesting. Yeah, I look that everybody does that, right? You because know, you're trying to get yourself informed it's like that game right you're trying to get your information and not give out your information at the same time so it's like yeah stuff well hey man i really appreciate you taking the time today it's been cool it was fun to catch up and uh talk again and see what you're doing and seeing that you know you're still in one piece you've got the triage version one I, i assume now it's triage two uh you know with some ppp funding and a little bit more people around you so maybe we can visit again, uh, see what it looks like in another month or two, see what you're up to. Yeah, uh, oh, it'll be interesting. To, uh, see uh, how you're making it work, man. I love these types of calls. So. Sounds good. Cool, man. So hold on one second here.